Hello and thank you for joining us. Today's webinar, Genetic Testing for Inherited Retinal Disorders, will be presented by Dr. Madhu Panchrami. Please note that we will not be taking audio questions. If you would like to submit a question, please submit it through either the Q&A or chat dialog box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please feel free to submit questions at any time. All questions will be answered during the Q&A portion of our program after the presentation. Dr. Pintrami is a human molecular geneticist at Prevention Genetics in Marshall, Wisconsin. She received her PhD in genetics from the University of Delhi and her master's degree in biotechnology from Pondicherry University, both in India. She joined Prevention Genetics in January 2013. At this time, I will hand it over to Dr. Pintrami. Thanks for the introduction, Rachel. Welcome everyone to the webinar and thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's uh, webinar topic is genetic testing for inherited retinal disorders. Um, by the end of this uh, webinar, we hope the participants will be able to explain the importance of genetic testing in ophthalmology uh, and also discuss different testing options for clinically and genetically heterogeneous inherited retinal disorders and also describe the benefits of uh, testing our comprehensive inherited retinal dystrophy panel, which consists of uh, 280 genes, and also understand the testing approach of this panel. Before going to the webinar topic, I would briefly talk about a prevention genetics. Prevention genetics is founded in 2004 by Dr. James Weber. Uh, he is the president of the company. Uh, Prevention Genetics is located in Marshfield, Wisconsin, which is in the upper Midwest region of the U.S. Uh, Prevention Genetics is a CATLIA and ISO accredited clinical laboratory. Um, it is a comprehensive source for high-value clinical germline genetic testing. We have a largest test menu option in the U.S., uh, testing for nearly all uh, clinically relevant genes. Uh, we have uh, standard sequencing, next generation sequencing for over 1,800 genes, and we also offer um, a next gen, uh, over 200 uh, next gen sequencing panels. Uh, we have uh, deletion duplication testing via RACGH and MLCA uh, for over 1,500 genes. We also have a whole exome sequencing um, called named uh, PG exome. Uh, recently, we have also launched uh, PG exome custom panels using uh, whole exome sequencing technology. With this, healthcare providers can order any subset of uh, genes from the list of uh, approximately 4,100 clinically relevant or disease-causing genes. Um, we accept test samples from physicians, genetic counselors, or other healthcare providers, we do not offer direct-to-consumer testing. The only service that we have direct-to-consumer is the DNA banking service, uh, which is a long-term storage of person's DNA. Dr. Weber uh, started this company uh, with the vision of uh, disease prevention through genetic testing, and our mission is to uh, provide high-quality clinical DNA testing to anyone in need at an affordable price. In my webinar, I will be talking uh, about um, ocular disorders, uh, the clinical diagnosis and molecular diagnosis, and I'll be majorly uh, focusing on the retinal disorders uh, and different testing options like prevention genetics. And also, um, finally, I will talk about our new comprehensive IRD panel, as I mentioned before. It comes with 280 genes. Vision is considered to be uh, the most important out of five senses. According to World Health Organization um, and American Academy of Ophthalmology, approximately uh, 285 million people are visually impaired. Um, in that, uh, out of approximately 39 million people are blind, and 246 million people have low vision. The major causes of uh, visual impairment is uh, uncorrected refractive errors uh, followed by cataract. But if you look at the pie chart here, the 
The major cause of the blindness is uh, cataract, which accounts for 51%, and which is that is followed by glaucoma and age-related macular degeneration, etc. And however, there is a huge portion of it is uh, undetermined. According to uh, WHO and AAO, approximately 80% of uh, eye disorders can be prevented or cured, or the disease progression could be slowed down if the, if the disease is detected at early stages. Given these statistics, the importance of early and accurate diagnosis through genetic testing cannot be understated. And also, with the advent of gene therapy and other types of treatment, the identification of a patient's genetic information is becoming increasingly important. The ocular disorders are um, divided into two major categories uh, based on what part of the eye has defect. Uh, the anterior segment dysgenesis is uh, one category where the anterior part of the eye has defect, for example, lens or cornea, corneal defect. Those are aniridia, congenital cataract, glaucoma, corneal dystrophies, etc. However, there are uh, several other inherited disorders with a significant ocular manifestation, for example, Marfan syndrome, Eisenfeld ring, so Rieger syndrome, etc. And the other uh, the major category is the retinal disorder that has a defect in the retina. Uh, in my webinar, I'll be majorly talking about these retinal disorders. Um, examples of those are achromatopsia, liver congenital amaurosis, retinitis pigmentosa. There are also other uh, disorders that are uh, retinoschisis, uh, which is the um, uh, vitreoretinal disorders. Um, familial exudative retinopathy, etc. Uh, the disorders that has a defect in the optic nerve or optic atrophy, Wolfram syndrome, etc. The clinical diagnosis of ocular disorders are made uh, based on age of onset, uh, whether it's a congenital disorder or a late onset or age related and also based on whether it's isolated or syndromic, whether it's confined, confined to the eye or whether other organs are also affected. And whether it's a stationary disorder or a progressive disorder, uh, whether it's, if it is a progressive disorder, whether it's a, a slowly progressing or rapidly progressive disorder. As I mentioned in the previous slide, it's also based on the site of defect or the function, whether it's a retinal disorder or anterior segment disorder, and also based on the fundus appearance. Uh, in this uh, picture, you can see the normal fundoscopy. And this is the uh, retinitis pigmentosa affected uh, fundus, where you can see the bone spicules uh, around the peripheral region of the retina, which is a characteristic feature of uh, retinitis pigmentosa. And the Stargardt disease uh, affected eye, you can uh, see the yellowish flux in the central region of the retina. However, with the liver congenital amaurosis, there is a wide variability of the fundus appearance based uh, depending on what gene has defect. So for the, those cases, the genetic testing would be helpful in making an accurate clinical diagnosis. And also, the clinical diagnosis is being made based on mode of inheritance, whether it's a dominant disorder, recessive, X-linked, or uh, digenic inheritance, etc. Um, as I mentioned, the genetic testing um, would be uh, helpful uh, or improve the accuracy of clinical diagnosis and also prognosis. Uh, to make any uh, crucial decisions for, uh, regarding profession, etc., and also um, it um, helps you know the risk of uh, future offspring or also to your family members. It also helps uh, clinicians to advise you on any treatment options that are available, uh, for example, RP65 gene therapy. Uh, in this picture, you can see uh, this is the one from the Foundation Fighting Blindness website. Um, they have a few successful uh, stories about this uh, gene therapy. 
See, young adults with virtually no vision can now read several lines on an eye chart and see better in dimly lit settings thanks to an innovative gene therapy aiming to reverse blindness uh, in a severe form of retinal disorder known as liver congenital amyloidosis. So testing uh, may lead a specific treatment, or treatment options in future. And one cannot deny that there are uh, risks or disadvantages. Uh, the positive report might make the person live in a state of anxiety, waiting for the symptoms to become evident. And also, knowledge of uh, future blindness may dominate one's life. Uh, for these kind of situations, a good genetic uh, counseling might be helpful. As I mentioned uh, in the rest of my webinar, I will be talking majorly about the retinal disorders. When I talk about the retinal disorders, I will be talking about the rounded degeneration, cone degeneration, etc. So I would briefly uh, go over the retina structure and its function. Retina is a nerve layer which is at the back of the eye and it senses light and creates nerve impulses which are sent to the brain through optic nerve. Uh, if you see closer uh, at the retina structure, uh, the retina has a region called macula that has a light sense cells, which are cones and rods, collectively known as photoreceptors. And within that macula, the region called fovea, which has a high density of cones. Cones are involved in uh, daylight vision, color vision, sharp central vision. And surrounding that area, uh, there is a uh, high density of uh, rods, which are involved in the dim light vision and uh, peripheral vision. The process that occurs in the, these photoreceptor cells is known as uh, the visual cycle. Here in this picture, the visual cycle is depicted in uh, rods uh, because it is extensively studied in the rods. The three major steps in the um, visual cycle is retinoid cycle, which is the regeneration of uh, retinoid, which is the vitamin, uh, derivative of uh, vitamin A. Uh, the retinoid is uh, uh, is required for the uh, absorption of light. Uh, it binds with the opsin pigment uh, that is required for the light absorption. And the phototransduction cascade uh, that generates electrical impulses, and the, these electrical impulses are sent to the synaptic terminal of this photoreceptor cell. The Proteins, if you can see in this uh, cycle, um, two, two different uh, two steps, um, there, there are several proteins that are involved in this uh, cycle, and those are uh, not synthesized in the outer segments of the photoreceptors. Both the retinoid cycle and phototransduction cascade occurs in the outer segment of the rod. So the proteins that are required for these uh, uh, steps that are synthesized in the inner segment those proteins are transported to the outer segment via uh, ciliary transport, uh, which is mediated by the ciliary protein. The ciliary proteins are uh, located in the transition zone of outer and inner segment. And when the electric, uh, the, uh, electrical impulses are generated at the synaptic terminal of the photoreceptor, those are transferred to the bipolar cells and to the ganglion cells and to the optic nerve and from there to brain. So you, you can see all, all this visual cycle process, um, it, it involves several proteins. So the, the protein, uh, the genes that encode these proteins, if there are any mutations or um, causative variants in those genes lead to uh, different retinal disorders. This is the retinal uh, uh, website, which is a retina network. It has information about all the loci that have been mapped and gene information and also different retinal disorders. Um, and so far, uh, there are 293 loci have been mapped and 256 genes have been identified. And if you uh, see this uh, graph uh, on x-axis, it's uh, mapped and identified uh, retinal disease genes uh, to date and on y-axis with numbers. And um, I, I think uh, 
From last year, there is not much uh, progress in the detection of new genes, kind of play toward. As I mentioned, those genes uh, causes the, the variants, causative variants in those genes causes different types of uh, retinal disorders. These retinal disorders, they have a huge phenotypic overlap. You can see in this picture uh, on x-axis, it is uh, whether it's a cone degeneration or the rod degeneration. Uh, on the y-axis, it's a progression of uh, disease with the age. The liver congenital amaurosis, which is a severe uh, form of uh, retinal disorder, it accounts the majority of the childhood blindness, blindness. and it reaches to its final stage uh, even in uh, in early stage, uh, early ages, early age. And it involves both uh, the rod and cone degeneration, and also the achronotopsia, which is the uh, only cone degeneration. Uh, that also is a severe uh, disorder. It actually reaches uh, to the final stage uh, at early stages, early age. And other disorders, Targa disease, uh, Combra dystrophy, and retinitis pigmentosa, uh, all uh, these look in the initial stages it's just only a cone degeneration or rod degeneration, but later stages it might turn off by both rods and cone, uh, cones are degenerated. So it is very uh, important, um, like genetic testing, uh, very helpful in these kind of uh, retinal disorder to make uh, accurate uh, clinical diagnosis. We do have a prevention and genetic uh, uh, panels of uh, liver congenital amaurosis, congenital stationary night blindness, retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, we have um, comprehensive uh, panels in the market. Uh, retinitis pigmentosa, we have ADG panels. So uh, choosing the right test uh, for these retinal dis disorder often challenging, and uh, I will talk about that in the next few slides. For the monogenic disorders such as uh, Targa disease and choroidopenia, uh, choosing one gene would give you a high detection rate. For example, the Targa disease, even though there is another gene that has been recently um, shown to be associated with this disease, but ABCA4 gene is the major uh, causative gene for the Targa disease. You can see in this published uh, data um, um, that their study identified um, compound heterozygous or homozygous uh, causative variants in ABCA4 gene in 65 to 70 percent of the Targa patients, and only one uh, pathogenic uh, causative variant was found in 15 to 20 percent of the patients. Probably in those patients. Uh, the deep intronic variants or copy number variants might be the second causative variant. Or um, off note, uh, the heterozygous carriers of ADCA4 pathogenic variants are at risk for age-related macular degeneration. And the choroidopenia, you can see in this published data, uh, where 95% of the affected um, uh, choroidopenia patients had pathogenic variants in the CHMG. Talking about the heterogeneous uh, disorders, uh, for example, liver congenital amaurosis, achromatopsia. Um, as I mentioned, we have a comprehensive uh, panel uh, in the market. Um, choosing a next gen sequencing panel would give you a high detection rate. Uh, for example, um, for the liver congenital amaurosis, we have tested, um, we have completed testing for 13 patients and 10 positive uh, uh, cases and three indeterminate cases that would give you 77% uh, detection rate. However, if you look at the indeterminate report, uh, in this patient uh, who, uh, from the consanguineous family, uh, the patient had a homozygous uh, uh, variant of uncertain significance in GUCY2D gene. Uh, GOCY2D gene is uh, one of the important uh, um, causative genes for the liver congenital amaurosis. You can see here, uh, it accounts for 20% of the uh, LCA cases. So this variant, which is undocumented, um, this, this is possibly the causative uh, variant in this, in, this in this patient's family. So this 
um, the provider had requested the uh, deletion duplication testing as a reflex testing. However, we suspect this uh, variant would be pathogenic if we did not proceed with the deletion duplication testing. And in this uh, case, we will contact the provider uh, to see how they wish to proceed. In this particular uh, case, um, maybe uh, testing the parents uh, to find out uh, they are carriers for this variant and also testing several um, family members uh, affected and unaffected uh, family members would uh, help us uh, know the clinical significance of this uh, particular variant. However, there are uh, complex uh, disorders, uh, for example, retinitis pigmentosa, or even testing AT genes uh, would not give you a high detection rate. Uh, so far, we have completed testing for 15 uh, retinitis pigmentosa patients, and uh, it gave us a 53% detection rate, which is similar to the published data. And uh, this retinitis pigmentosa, we do offer um, uh, we do offer subpanels based on the um, inheritance mode of mode of inheritance. Um, dominant uh, retinitis pigmentosa panel, autosomal recessive retinitis pigmentosa panel, and X-linked retinitis pigmentosa panel. And we have tested approximately 13 uh, X-linked retinitis pigmentosa patients, and uh, we found all positive cases in the RPGR gene. That would give us a 70% uh, detection rate. And um, the, all the uh, variants that we found in this RPGR, uh, six, six variants were in the ORF15 region, were ORF15 region, which is a very critical and challenging uh, region to sequence. Uh, however, we have uh, no uh, next-gen sequencing coverage for this particular region. So we have a special chemistry um, that whenever we um, you have this uh, RPGR, Gene in uh, in any of our panels, we do uh, have a special chemistry done for the SWAR 15 region. And so far, um, we have tested over 335 patients for the SWAR 15 region, either via panel or uh, targeted testing. And we have found 63% of the variants were in the SWAR 15 region. Um, 70% of the variants in this war 15 region, and majority of the variants are uh, friendship protein truncating variants. Um, so talking about this uh, RPGR gene, RPGR uh, gene is um, uh, in two different uh, transcripts, it has two different transcripts. Isoform A is uh, the, uh, that uses the different uh, uh, cryptic Slice site, and uh, you can see the difference uh, between the isoform A and isoform C is the exon 15. Uh, the exon 15 is bigger in isoform C. And isoform A has 1 to 19 exons, and isoform C has uh, 1 to 15. Uh, the variants in the isoform A are associated with the uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia. Uh, in the isoform C, uh, the variants in this uh, isoform has uh, been associated with the retinitis pigmentosa. And this ORF15 region, um, uh, there is a uh, uh, GA-rich region, um, and uh, it's very uh, critical uh, and very challenging to take sequence via next-gen sequencing. As I mentioned, we have a special uh, chemistry standard sequencing uh, test for this region. You can see the uh, primers, uh, overlapping primers to have a better coverage. And we have uh, um, several overlapping sequence traces to make accurate uh, the variant call. And if you look at the uh, documented positive variants, they are spread throughout the um, RPGR gene. However, if you look at uh, this region, the ORF 15 region, the majority of the positive variants are in this uh, exon 15, so which makes the, uh, which emphasizes the importance of testing this particular region. And also, um, the females uh, it, who are heterozygous carriers of uh, protein truncating variants in this uh, ORF 15 are shown to have a um, wide uh, range of phenotypes which can vary from asymptomatic to severe disease, which is similar to the male affected patients. So that depends on 
if the patient has a protein truncating variant in the 5 prime end of the ORF15, uh, they are severely affected as compared to the patients, uh, those have a protein truncating variant in the 3 prime end. So, which can be only um, uh, known through the genetic testing to see um, the outcome or the severity of the disease in the family members. And so, as I mentioned, we always uh, have this uh, ORF15 region covered in all of our uh, panels where the RPGR is the uh, gene is present. And our new comprehensive inherited retinal disorder panel um, has 280 genes, and this uh, panel also includes the RPGR ORF15 coverage. However, we don't have uh, data uh, since that was uh, launched or introduced recently. Uh, we have uh, earlier we have uh, the same panel for. Uh, that consisted of 107 genes. Uh, the 107 genes, uh, in the, we have some data uh, for that uh, panel. Um, we have tested so far uh, 14 uh, patients, and out of 14 patients, we had seven uh, positive cases. And you can see in the pie chart uh, where uh, this, the genes were all listed where we found uh, positive in, positive in which gene. So um, earlier, as I mentioned, we had the 107 gene panel. Now we have 280 gene panel because you can see the 50% of it is undetermined. Our uh, molecular diagnosis was not made. Um, so with the same size, we thought of uh, having more genes tested for this panel uh, with our tiered approach. The uh, tiered approach we have um, we have carefully curated this uh, particular panel uh, to achieve a high detection rate or maximize the detection rate and also decrease the burden of uh, several uh, variants of uncertain significance. In the tiered approach, first we would do the uh, 107 genes uh, first. We sequence all the coding regions as well as the flanking plus or minus 20 um, uh, non-coding region or intronic region. Uh, however, there are a few exceptions. I will talk in the next, my next slide. And if we see uh, no uh, conclusive results or suspected results in the tier one, we would reflect to the remaining genes, uh, which is uh, 173. Uh, hopefully, uh, we don't have to reflect at least 50% of the cases. Our 50% detection rate uh, kind of matches with, uh, even though our number is low, but it kind of matches with the um, um, published data. This was published by our UK group, where they have tested uh, 105 gene diagnostic uh, uh, NGS test for inherited retinal disorder. Um, they have tested 537 patients who were referred for inherited retinal disorder. And out of 537, they have found um, uh, causative variants in 271 patients in 62 genes, which would also give um, the 51% of uh, detection rate. And we have all these genes uh, in our tier one, except the FBD4 um, that has been shown um, in, at least reported in two or more individuals. And also there is another study by a different group. Uh, they, uh, their study, depending on the initial clinical diagnosis, they identified likely causative mutations in 55% of the uh, retinal pigmentosa and 80% of the variable or Usher syndrome cases. And if you look at this uh, pie chart, uh, you can see there are few genes that are um, that gives a high detection rate or high clinical sensitivity, and the H2 is the major um, causative gene for the inherited retinal dystrophy, um, non-syndromic inherited retinal dystrophy. So uh, we hope uh, that at least for the 50 percent of uh, the patients, we we don't have to reflex to the tier two. 
as I mentioned, they, uh, we have uh, for this panel we have additional standard sequencing which performed for any regions that are not captured or with insufficient number of sequence reads. Uh, our minimum depth of coverage is uh, 20x. Uh, all pathogenic variants, likely pathogenic, or variants of uncertain significance are confirmed by Sanger sequencing. And we also perform uh, additional Sanger sequencing for few exonic uh, regions, for example, RPGR OR15, and also deep intronic uh, variants that are documented recurrently uh, reported in patients. Uh, for example, the ABCA4, STEP290, and H2A. Uh, so you can see a uh, study. Um, indicated that the deep intronic variant in step 290 accounts for 21% of the cases uh, of uh, step 290 associated LCA cases, liver congenital amaurosis cases. So we have included those uh, for the, to again maximize the uh, detection rate. And as I mentioned, a few genes that do not have 100% coverage. Um, either could be due to uh, GC-rich uh, uh, regions or uh, some other homology uh, problems. So we have calculated that uh, overall, uh, the 19, over 99.99% uh, 99 of the bases are covered using the whole exome uh, plus standard back cell approach. However, if we find a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in any of those genes that are not covered 100%, we will do, we will try our best to uh, do standard back cell. And another feature is since this uh, test is performed using exome capture probe, a reflex to exome sequencing may be ordered uh, for $990. Um, I mentioned, I have mentioned before that we don't have uh, uh, enough patients that test us for the 280 gene panel. Uh, but we do have uh, some data for the 107 gene panel that was tested uh, earlier uh, uh, earlier for the inherited retinal disorder. Um, this is one positive report in this patient. The patient is apparently homozygous and for a variant in the PDE6A gene. Um, and the provider had ordered uh, deletion duplication testing. Uh, so since we found a causative variant in this patient, we did not uh, reflex to the deletion duplication testing. And we would recommend doing the uh, parental study to find out whether the parent patients are, um, the uh, patient's parents are heterozygous carriers for this variant. Uh, this is an, uh, one indeterminate, rate, indeterminate report uh, for that 107 uh, gene panel. Uh, we have found several VUSs uh, in this patient. Uh, um, in, however, in one gene, we have found two uh, variants of uncertain significance. Uh, these uh, variants, for some uh, cases, we can detect the phase of the variants, whether they're on the same chromosome or opposite chromosome without testing the parents. Uh, for example, in this particular uh, patient, uh, the, we could find out the uh, phase of the variant based on our next-gen sequencing data. Uh, if the variant, both the variants are covered by the same probe, and they are within um, like four, 300 to 400 base pair uh, proximity, uh, we can find out the phase. Um, you can see here um, if they are in the same uh, read, the, both the variants. If they are in the opposite chromosomes, one read will have the one variant, the other read will have the other variant. So you can see uh, this particular two variants are on the same chromosomes. Uh, however, these two variants were uh, reported in a compound heterozygous state in a patient uh, with uh, retinitis pigment Um It is possible this patient might have a Second plausible uh, way, causative variant in the deep intronic or promoter region, or it might be a copy number variant. Sorry. However, um, this, this particular gene is not well studied, and there are not many uh, uh, the variants that have been documented causative uh, to date. And there are no uh, copy number variants that are also documented positive in this uh, gene. Mm. In this uh, kind of uh, cases, probably um, like a 
using a bigger panel, uh, if um, we could, if we, if we get this kind of cases uh, in the 280 gene panel, we would reflect to the tier two uh, to find out um, any positive variant in the patient. However, for this particular case, we cannot do because uh, we have done this with the, our version one uh, exome testing. Now we have our version two. So the, the patients that were tested previously, they cannot um, opt for a reflex to the uh, tier two. Only the patients that we have uh, for accession for the 280 gene now, we can do the tiering approach. And also, uh, as you have seen, there are several other VUSs in this 107 panel. So you can imagine the number of VUSs that we might uh, find unnecessarily uh, if, uh, if we could find a pathogenic variance with the 107 gene itself. So it would heavily reduce the burden of uh, variants of uncertain significance, which would not be helpful in the, which will, would not have any clinical utility. And the last, we have on, only completed test for one patient for the 280 gene panel. And in this patient, we have found the protein truncating pathogenic variant H2A and a variant of uncertain significance in the same gene. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the H2A is a major causative gene for the inherited retinal disorder. Um, it is possible that the variant of uncertain significance uh, the variant of uncertain significance uh, along with the protein truncating variant could be uh, the cause of disease in this patient, but uh, there are also um, possibilities that the patient might have a copy number variant. So um, in this uh, particular case, we again, we did not uh, reflex to the tier two as we suspect this is the gene that is causative in this uh, patient uh, and causative for the phenotype. And we would uh, recommend doing a deletion duplication testing uh, to detect any, or detect or rule out any copy number variants because uh, copy number variants are recurrently reported in H2A genes, uh, just to rule out, the, which would also help us know the significance of this uh, particular uh, variant that is undocumented. And also family study of uh, several affected and unaffected with individuals also have, would help uh, to know the clinic, uh, the, the VUS uh, clinical significance. Um, with this, um, um, I complete my webinar. Um, I would, uh, before ending this webinar, I would want to talk about our coming soon expanded panels. Uh, we have uh, um, anophthalmia and microphthalmia and extreme sequencing panels. We have added several genes. Uh, that are also associated with the syndromic uh, form of anophthalmia and microphthalmia. So it will be 37 gene panel. And uh, uh, we are also expanding our cone rod dystrophy panel, exemplary reader syndrome panel, and glaucoma panel. And we are also working on um, um, getting a comprehensive uh, cataract panel, which might have uh, approximately 180 genes. And also, um, we are working on comprehensive anterior segment dysgenesis panel, which would include all the genes that are associated with the cat uh, glaucoma, and uh, aniridia, et cetera, all that genes associated with the anterior part of the ID site. With that, uh, I thank everyone uh, for attending today's webinar. Uh, I, I will take any questions you may have. Thank you again. Okay, and just a reminder, if you'd like to submit a question, please submit through either the Q&A or chat dialog box. Both are on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and look at the first question. Does the panel cover all documented intronic variants in the listed genes? Um, that's a good question. Um, we, as you mentioned, uh, we are not um, like covering all the documented intronic variants, but we are covering the recurrently reported uh, intronic, deep intronic variants. If we have to cover all the deep intronic variants, that would increase the cost of uh, the panel uh, because we have to have our standard access for all those. Um, so for sure, we have included all those deep intronic variants that have um, repeatedly seen in uh, uh, inherited retinal dystrophy patients. Okay, and then the next question, 
Um, you had mentioned doing parental studies on a positive report. Could you just talk about, I guess, what the cost would be if uh, someone wanted to do targeted testing on a family member where you have a positive report? Um, positive report, um, we have a, for, if, uh, for the positive report, we would charge 250 per variant. Uh, if it falls in the same exon, um, it would be the same cost. If it is in two different exons and if it is two, uh, two variants, it would increase the cost to probably two times uh, 250. I think, yeah. Um, you can see our website uh, for more information about the targeted testing. However, um, we do have a VUS follow up. Uh, if we find any VUSs, we would charge free of uh, cost for at least two family members. Okay, thank you. And I did just double check if there's two variants that we're testing for on the targeted, it's $370. Okay, thank you, Rachel. All right, and then it looks like. All right, one more question on here. What does prevention genetics do with the remainder of the submitted? Specimen sample, so any leftover DNA. Um, I think we uh, store, store it for uh, like six months or so, and maybe after that we would not keep it. Right, so we do hang on to the samples for a certain amount of time just in case there is um, somebody wanting to reflect mm -hmm. testing. So, as was mentioned, maybe um, going with that large, large IRD pound going to exome testing. Mm -hmm. So we do hold on to the specimens, you know, for a certain limited amount of time. Uh, we do also then offer discounted DNA banking to anyone who has testing at Prevention Genetics. So it's a one-time fee of ninety-eight dollars, and then we would store that DNA for a minimum of fifty years. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, and then we do have another question that is: in the case of a known mutation plus a BUS in a recessive gene, such as your last USH2A example is free family testing offered for both variants. Um, that's a good question. We offer free testing only for the VUS, but we would charge for the pathogenic variant. Uh, the reason we are uh, offering the free of cost to um, better understand that uh, variant of uncertain uh, significance uh, to test many family members so, so that we can um, know the pathogenicity of that uh, particular uh, variant of uncertain significance. That is the reason behind free of uh, charge testing for the VUSs. For the pathogenic variants, we do uh, like charge. Okay, and that looks like all of our questions for today. So that's going to conclude our program. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you again for joining us.